This is covering Chapter 15, Monopoly and Antitrust Policy. A monopoly is a market structure consisting of a firm that is the only seller of a good or service, but does not have a close substitute. Monopolies exist at the opposite end of the competition spectrum of, to perfect competition. We study monopolies for two reasons. One, some firms truly are monopolists, so it's important to understand how they behave. And two, firms might collude in order to act like a monopolist with the important implications for the firm behavior. It is reasonable to ask if a monopoly truly ever exists. For example, suppose you live in a small town with only one pizzeria. Is the pizzeria a monopoly? It has competition from other fast food restaurants. It has competition from grocery stores that provide pizzas you cook at home. If you consider these alternatives to be close substitutes, then the pizzeria would not be a monopoly. If you don't consider these to be close substitutes, then we would consider the pizzeria a monopoly. Regardless, the pizzeria's unique position may afford it some monopoly power to raise prices and obtain positive economic profit. Is Google mon a monopoly? Although there are many other firms and search engines, Google has a dominant market share, 70% in the U.S. and 90% in Europe. In the strictest sense, Google is not a monopoly. There are other search engines. But its dominant market position provides it with many advantages, like the ability to exclude competitors from its content. This is a big problem and it's an ongoing situation and Microsoft is complaining about Google. Of course, Google argues its superiority is what has caused its high market share. Modern governments realize monopolies are generally bad for consumers and discourage their existence. So where do they come from? Uh, for a firm to exist as a monopoly, there must be barriers to enter the market, preventing other firms from coming in and competing with it. There are four main barriers. Government restrictions on entry, exclusive control over a key resource, network externalities, and natural monopolies. The U.S. government blocks, blocks entries in two main ways, patents and copyrights and public franchises. Newly developed patents like drugs are frequently granted patents, newly developed products. Um, these exclusive rights to the product for a period of 20 years from the date at which the patent was filed. If you read in the chapter, it takes a, a drug company must apply for the patent 10 years before it actually goes to market. So that means they only have 10 years on the open market to make profit before someone else, every other play, um, pharmaceutical manufacturer can make a generic of its copy, a generic copy of this and basically erode away all the profits once that happens. So patents are important. They, they protect our ability to be creative and innovative. Similarly, copyrights provide exclusive rights to produce or sell creative works like books, films, music, etc. As you know, illegal downloading of music has kind of eroded copyright laws in a way. Patents and copyrights encourage innovation and creativity, and without them, firms would not be able to substantially profit from their own endeavors. And then there's such a thing as a public franchise, a government designation that a firm will be the only legal provider of a good or service known as a public franchise. These might exist, for example, in electricity and water markets. For example, um, there's usually only one electrical provider. So in West Springfield, the, the, the town doesn't provide an electric company, National Grid does. Um, but, or in Holyoke, you have Holyoke Gas and Electric, so they have their own. Exclusive control over key resources is the second reason. For many years, Aluminum Company of America, or Alcoa, either owned or had long-term contracts for most of the world's supply of bauxite, the mineral for which we obtain aluminum. Such control over a key resource served as a substantial barrier for firms to enter. Some say that the NFL is a, is a monopoly. It acts like a monopoly in this manner. It ensures that the majority of the world's best football players go under contract in the NFL and are not able to play in other leagues. In the book, they talk about the whole idea of the Christmas plant, and for years, Paul F. Ranch in, in California had a monopoly on poinsettias. They had exclusive control over a key resource, a botanical secret that we discovered, he discovered that allowed multiple branches to grow from one stem of a native Mexican wildflower. Eventually, researchers discovered X secret and published it. The result, the barriers were broken, competitors quickly mimicked the poinsettias, prices fell to the competitive level, eroding their economic profit. They basically sold off the lands to become a greenhouse. The most famous monopoly is based on the control of raw materials in the De Beers Diamond Monopoly. The South African De Beers 
firm sought to control as much of the supply of diamonds as possible, resulting in it being able to keep the prices high. But by 2000, new competitors had eroded De Beers' control of the world's diamond production to 40%. Seeking to maintain its monopoly power, De Beers started branding its diamonds with a forever mark, supposed, supposedly indicating high quality. Do you think that this strategy will be, bring long-term success? Sometimes. Sometimes. Economists refer to the third part as third barrier as network externalities, as the situation of the usefulness of the product increases with the number of consumers who use it. HD televisions, com computer operating systems like Windows, social networking sites. I think about Office and how almost all businesses use Excel, and so it, it creates network externalities. So if I'm going to use Excel and then I need to send the worksheet to someone else, if you don't have it, it kind of makes you at a disadvantage at that point because the, because the more people that have it, the more useful it is. These network externalities can set off a virtuous cycle for a firm, allowing a firm the value of its products to continue to increase along with the price it can charge. But consumers may be locked into an inferior product, and that's why they don't like these things to happen. A natural monopoly occurs when economies of scale are so large the firm can supply the entire market at a lower average total cost than the two firms. If you look here, point A is one firm, point B is two firms, and therefore this is a lower cost. So in the study of oligopoly, we abandon the idea of marginal cost and marginal revenue because strategic interaction between the firms over erodes this concept. Monopolists have no competition, hence no concern about strategic interaction. They just seek to maximize profit by choosing a quantity to produce, just like perfect and monopolistic competitors. In fact, monopolists are very le much like monopolistic competitors and have a downward-facing demand curve. The difference is that barriers will prevent others from competing away their economic profit. Time Warner Cable. I think about this all the time. Why can't we just have cable competition? If you believe that Netflix is a closed substitute, then you would say it's not a monopoly. But if you don't, then you would say that Time Warner Cable will have a monopoly because there's only one cable company in each scenario. So Time Warner Cable, as you can see, the price goes down, the number of subscribers goes up, total revenue goes up, but the average total revenue and marginal revenue go down because the more consumers they get on board, the lower the, to the marginal revenue and the lower the average revenue. Revenue increases from selling an additional unit of output at whatever price is necessary to convince the new customer. Revenue decreases the, because the price reduction is shared with existing customers. So marginal revenue is always below demand for monopolists. MC, so monopolists maximize profit by producing the quantity where the additional revenue from the last unit just equals the additional cost from producing it or marginal cost equals marginal revenue for monopolists. So in the long run, so since there are barriers to enter, additional firms cannot enter the market, so there is no distinction between short run and long run for a monopoly. Then, unlike m for monopolistic competition, we expect monopolists to continue to earn a profit in the long run. One question is, does monopoly reduce economic efficiency? Um, so they give a whole example of what would happen to potatoes and the price of potatoes and the number of potatoes that would that would be consumed in a perfectly competitive market or if one person bought up all the small firms. And this does cause some some small economic um, inefficiency or dead weight because fewer potatoes would be traded at a higher price and consumers uh, consumer surplus will fall and producer surplus must rise. So perfectly competitive markets maximize the economic surplus in the market. If fewer trades take place, the economic surplus must fall. And this is dead weight loss from a monopoly, monopoly B. But we talk about this, and it, it's relatively there are relatively few monopolies, so the economic dead weight uh, loss due to inefficiency is relatively small. 
Um, but many firms have market power or the ability to charge a price greater than marginal cost. In fact, the only firms that do not have market power are perfectly competitive firms, and perfect competition is rare. Economists believe that overall, the loss of efficiency in the United States due to market power is probably less than 1% of the total U.S. production, or $480 per person annually. Why so low? Most firms face a relatively large degree of competition, resulting in prices much closer to marginal cost than we would see with monopolies. So deadweight loss due to market power is relatively small. Market power can produce some benefits for an economy. The pr prospect of market power and the resulting economic profit drives the firms to innovate, creating new products and services. This drive affects large firms who reinvest profits in the hope of making larger future profits, and small firms who hope to obtain profits like that for themselves. The Austrian economist Joseph Schemter claimed that this would drive a single gale of creation destruction that would eventually benefit consumers more than an increased price and competition. This helps explain government's ambivalence regarding large firms' market power. So antitrust laws and antitrust enforcement. During the 80s, 1870s and 1880s, several trusts had formed board of trustees that oversaw operations of several firms in the industry and enforced collusive agreements. This helped prompt anti U.S. antitrust laws aimed at eliminating the collusion and promoting competition among firms. The most important of these laws are the below. So first in 1890, we had the Sherman Act, which prohibited restraint of trade, including price fixing and collusion. It also outlawed monopolization. Then in 1914, we have the Clayton Act, which prohibited firms from buying stock in competitors and from having directors serve on the board of comp competing firms. And then again in 1914, we had the Federal, Federal Trade Commission Act. The FTC um, was established to help administer antitrust laws. In 1936, we have the robinson patman Act, which prohibited firms from charging buyers different prices if that would result in reduced competition. And then we have seller kevar toughened restrictions on mergers by preventing, prohibiting any merger that would reduce competition. The federal government is more concerned about horizontal mergers than mergers between, uh, which are mergers between firms in the same industry, as vertical mergers which are mergers between firms in two different stages of production. Such mergers are likely to enhance a firm's market power. I'm not going to cover this part. So the DOJ and the FTC um, are the economists and the lawyers of the Department of Justice and the Federal Trade Commission developed guidelines for themselves and firms to use when evaluating whether a potential merger was acceptable. These include market definition, measure of concentration, and merger standards. So suppose Henry Foods wants to buy us. Um, Henry Foods sought to merge with Marge Inc. Mars Inc. In what market do these firms compete? The market for candy, the market for snacks, or the market for all food? The more broadly defined the market, the smaller and more harmless the merger appears. Uh, candy bars is a small portion of the food market. It might be a bigger portion of the snack market, but definitely a huge portion of candy. To determine the appropriate scope of the market, the government tries to determine which goods are close substitutes by those produced by the firm. The appropriate market is defined as the smallest market containing the firm's products, for which an overall price rise within the market would result in total market profits increasing. If profits would decrease, this, there must be adequate substitutes available, hence the market is too narrowly defined. One way is what we already talked about, the four firm concentration. We talked about this in oligopolies is the percentage of sales that can be accounted for by the largest four firms. It can be useful, but the government seeks more detailed overall picture. That is why they use the HHI index, which is basically an index for measuring uh, the impact of a merger. I'm not going to go into the calculating this and the formula, but I will. We, they did pose the question. In early 2011, AT&T agreed to buy T-Mobile. AT&T is the second largest wireless, mobile wireless provider, and T-Mobile is the fourth. The merger created would have created a large increase in market concentration. The firm claimed that they could operate more efficiently together, closing hundreds of redundant stores and combining technical and support staff. AT&T estimated cost savings of $3 billion per year. After several months, the DOJ filed suit to block the merger, rejecting AT&T's cost-saving estimates. 
In late 2011, AT&T admitted defeat and dropped its merger plans. And lastly, we have natural monopolies. Natural monopolies have the potential to serve customers more cheaply than multiple firms, but the usual market forces that drive down prices don't exist. Local and state regulatory commissions typically set prices for natural monopolies instead of allowing them to set prices. But the, that raises the question, what price should the regulators choose? A price that makes the monopoly an economic zero profit? The efficient price that would maximize consumer welfare? Monopoly is a market structure. A natural monopoly is a reason the market structure exists. Monopolies do not need to be natural monopolies. No monopolist, not even a natural monopolist, tries to minimize cost. Marginal cost equals marginal re revenue guides an unregulated monopolist. While our graphs tend to show that efficiency loss from monopolies can be high, estimates of efficiency loss due to all market power is really quite low, or less than 1% of total output. And that is an overview of monopolies.